I'm John Hall. This is Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. And it's a twofer today with two of my favorite people, M. Souter and Don Tess. And we're going to be talking about tap rooms, beer counts, book writing, and general frivolity. First, a reminder to check out BeerEdge.com for articles, our merch shop, episodes of the Beer Edge podcast, and more. Plus, you can follow Beer Edge on social media at the Beer Edge and catch up on all things smoked beer on the This Week in Rauk Beer page on Facebook and on Twitter and Instagram at TW Rauk Beer. And always defend Pilsner. You can learn a lot about advertising and supporting this work by reaching out to Liz Melby on email. She's always available at Liz at BeerEdge.com. And speaking of that, this episode is brought to you through support from NZ Hops. In a little country far down in the Pacific, you'll find a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted for over 150 years with creativity and passion to produce some of the world's finest hops. This is NZ Hops. The industry originated in 1843, not long after the early settlers arrived from England. Years of partnership with a dedicated hop breeding program and farming knowledge handed down through the generations sees the current-day master growers proudly providing 18 unique New Zealand hop varieties to the world. Visit nzhops.co.nz or find them on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at nzhopsltd. We'll get into it all in a moment, but first, I'm happy to say that this episode is sponsored by Source Farmhouse Brewing in New Jersey. And joining me on the line is Jeremy Watts. He's a brewer there, and Jeremy, you have this new beer coming out that's centered around mental health awareness. Tell me about the project. Yeah, the project is called Things We Don't Say. It was started by Eagle Park Brewing and Distilling Company and Hope for a Day Foundation. Uh, The initiative is used to start the conversation and bring more awareness to mental health in the industry by the use of craft beer. And it's such an important conversation to have. Um, you'll be back at the bottom of the show to tell us more about this particular beer. But for now, I'll invite everybody to check out sourcebrewing.com as well as the Hope for the Day website at hftd.org. And it's okay to not be okay. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, John. Welcome to the show. Writing a book is hard, and I've done it several times now, and it's a privilege, but it can leave the brain feeling crispy, and that's where I'm at today. I handed in the manuscript for my latest yesterday, and I'm sitting here like a bowl of mush today. I can't even get the metaphors aligned properly, so I want to have some fun to kick back and to just chat with some friends. So this week, joining me via Zoom is M. Satter. She is the creator and creative force behind Pints and Panels. It's a comic website that is about as much about fun as it is about education. See, I can't even get through the opening script. Uh, She's also the author of Beer is for Everyone of Drinking Age, and it's available where books are found. And she's on the line from Connecticut. And joining us from the great white north of Calgary is Dantes. He is a writer, an enthusiast. He's a social media tour de force and a chronicler of not only great beer, but also whiskey. Hi, everybody. How y'all doing? How are you? Good. Yeah. How are you? (laughs) I feel like this is this is part support group, part therapy, and um, I'm I'm better now that I'm talking to you guys. It's uh, one o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday. Uh, I am desperately trying not to open a beer because I still have more work to do, but uh, I'm 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 getting there. Um, What's good in your guys' world? You know, I wrote a book. I'm happy about it. Like it's it's going to be out in the world, and as much as it's it's kicked my ass, like. You know, it's a, it's a cool thing to do. So, you know, my heart is full and my heart is happy professionally. What about you guys? What's going on? Um, I'm going to let M go first because oh, she's writing a book. I'm writing a book. Yeah. That's what I was working on this morning. Is your heart full? Is your heart happy? Or are you at the point where you just want to burn the house down because the manuscript is in it? Um, I work differently. So it's, it's, um, since I have to do when you when you're an artist, you have to write it, but you also have to draw it and then you also have to lay it out. So what I've been doing recently is I laid out most of the book and then by layout, I mean, like I put all the words on the page, essentially. And yeah. I write in a weird way where like I don't really you don't really write a book when you do a cart. I, I, like it's very like blocky. I don't really know how to explain what I do. And then it's I, like silos that all come together. 
So it's like, so like each page I have uh, like today on this page, we're gonna talk about hard water and what is hard water. And so I have like, here's where the brewer who's doing water chemistry is gonna go and then I'll draw it and then I'll lay it in and then I have to color it. And so it's like a very, like there's multiple steps. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. I'm trying to draw most of the book. I can only draw in the morning, which is a very bizarre, I know like, I, everyone who has different like working tendencies. So yeah. I can really only draw in the morning. I just can't draw in the afternoon, but I can digitally clean up in the afternoon. So I usually spend my mornings drawing and then the afternoons are for digital cleanup. So on, on the same yeah. thing, or do you go back to previous things to clean up? Uh, it depends on what my work, how much I got done. Sometimes there'll be, I'll have things to do in the morning. So I only get X amount of stuff done and then draw that and then or you know clean that up in the the next day i'm always working on like there's freelance stuff you're working on i have commissions yeah. my book other stuff and so and then there's just i get where i just want to like do more so i lay like i'm i draw a glass a day so like a proper glassware so this morning after i was finished working on my book i drew a boot a german drinking boot. <laughs> nice because i was like i just want to draw a boot and so that's what I, and then I'll spend the afternoon cleaning and, you know, making it look nice and then laying it out and there's strict stuff you have to do there and whatnot. So there's always something when you're your own boss and run your own company, like pints and panels is now a legit, like it has a credit card. Um, Ooh. Yeah, I know. I'll pints and panels <laughs> will buy you a beer next time I see you guys. Um, <laughs> Yay. So, yeah. <laughs> But, 2022. Yeah, 20, yeah, 2022. <laughs> pines and panels owes you guys around. Um, so there's, you know, trying to run a small business while also like making money while also doing other stuff while also writing a book. It's just yeah, a lot of stuff. But I'm at home. My husband works during the day, so it's just me and the cat. And you know, Mobo. Mobo, yeah, she's here somewhere. I don't know. I don't know where. Oh, she's uh, she's eating, but she's here. She's in the room with me. So, you know, just hanging S out. Speaking of buying drinks, I owe Don a bottle of bourbon and, mm. and a good bottle of bourbon because when I launched this particular show, uh, being non-creative, I could not for the life of me think of uh, a good name for the podcast, you know, I, cause I had hosted other podcasts that had some, you know, some good names or just, you know, company names or whatever. And uh, I could not think of what I was going to call the show. And so I sent an email out to, a, you know, to, to a bunch of friends and said, you know, what do you think I should call this? And Don goes, well, didn't you write a book called drink beer, think beer? Why don't you that just was my call very it creative uh, idea? <laughs> yeah. And, and his email came through and I'm standing in, I think in the kitchen uh, with, with my wife, April. And I'm like, motherfucker like what a great idea so now uh i have to buy don uh gladly uh an excellent bottle of bourbon and i just haven't seen you since this show launched no, in 2019 because we've all been been underground um so that's on the way don uh i might actually use the company credit card to buy it because i can see that as a as a as a worthy business expense <laughs> um what's good in your world what's making your heart happy and full these days um, well, I'm, I'm writing more, uh, I know I, I seem to have a, I seem to have found an outlet that will let me write what I'm interested, at least one of the subjects I'm interested in writing about, which is malt. Um, so I, I seem to have a regular outlet where I can write about malt. Is so this an outlet that we know? Uh, it is. Do, do you want to tell people where you can find it, where they can find it? Um, more on the, so there's craft beer and brewing magazine. Sure. But they I've also heard of have it. a, yeah, they they have a brewing industry guide. So it's yeah, more I've heard of that uh, as well. brewer facing. Yeah. yeah. Um, which lets me, cause I, I really like, I mean, I literally spent two weeks reading everything I could about free amino nitrogen and that's the <laughs> type fan. of stuff. Well, yeah. I, I'm a big fan. You're a big um, <laughs> that's the type of stuff i love grooving on and and then uh, so now to have an outlet to be able to write about it i think is 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 that makes my heart happy good good yeah. i'm glad uh you know i'm glad you're getting paid for for good words um and was talking about how you know she'll she'll you know spend time writing you know hard water and you know the the, the research phase i think is always what people don't think about in what we do and 
you know, if you're if you're spending you know, two weeks reading as much as you can, can you start writing before you're done with your research phase? Or do you like how do you each approach it? Like, do, do you have as much as you can to take notes along the way and then try to bang out an article or, you know, a piece in a short period of time? Or do you have to keep researching and writing at the same time? I tend to develop a theory. I pitch and, and, and that, you know, I develop a theory by having read the tip of the iceberg on a subject, I guess, or research yeah. the tip of an iceberg. Uh, I, I develop a theory. It's all, that's always a fraught with a little bit of danger because, you know, you do have to be writing about something that hasn't been written about before. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, you then pitch the article and then assuming it gets accepted, uh, you then deep dive into the research. And this is just, as you were saying, John, I don't want to spend too much time researching something that, and then not getting paid for it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but the next, the, you know, uh, what follows from that is I have to be prepared to pivot in case my tip of the iceberg revealed something that ended up not being quite correct or, or whatever. Um, so that, I mean, that's the way I do it. And what about you? Cause I mean, it's so much of the education drawing and writing that you're doing these days um, is really to help other people become more immersed in the beer industry. And so, you know, being cavalier, I guess is not in your nature, but you're also writing for shorter spaces. You know, like if Don can turn in 2,500 words, you know, you're, you're not doing the same amount of words. Um, how, how do you approach it? Uh, well, for my book right now, I've been, I lay out the page and then I'll do the research. So like today, I really wanted to draw that, uh, that thing. It was in the news, the Egyptian, that industrialized Egyptian brewery they just found in, oh, yeah. in Egypt. Yeah. But I couldn't for the life of me figure out the scale. Like the pictures don't, there's no article. So I spent my, like most of my morning trying to figure out how, like how fucking big this thing was. <laughs> And I'm like, because I don't want to like. Right. Was my... it was it a nano or was it no, you know, Anheuser Busch along the the airport? Yeah. It's it's literally the like it's the the brewery could make um what forty thousand pints a day something insane. Yeah. And so, but I was like, but I've never seen a brewery that looks like that before, obviously, because it's like terracotta and built into a ground and whatnot, and I don't know yeah. how they. And so, trying to figure out the scale. But then also I was drawing because I work in like very like I work on like I have a to do list and then I just kind of work in small chunks. So I had to this morning I spelled uh, I'm doing work for the Institute of Brewing and Distilling in London and I Americanized, oh, cool. I Americanized I them, yeah. some words. I didn't know sulfide is a pH there, not an F. Um, okay. So it was on my to do list to change that I had gotten flavor. Or yeah, well, sure. Yeah, the, the way that Don spells it. Yeah, Don. What are some? Uh, what are some way. of the other ones that we don't spell correctly for your tastes? Uh, flavor so is one. Flavor and then center R E versus E R. Oh, and theater, right? Yeah, theater yeah. as well. Yeah. Color. Yeah. Color. Yeah. O U R. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of. <laughs> so I had that, but also I work in like chunks. So I also had to do a bunch of research. I'm doing the Pilsner, the history of Pilsner, and I wanted to draw. 1840s Czech citizens. Sure. And I mean, so they're mostly like, skeletons now, but well, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, when they were alive and I wanted them. So I'm like, but I don't know if they wear German fashion or, or they have like, who are these people? So I've been kind of doing a, the fashion part of the book is way more the research I'm doing that. And that's really difficult finding like period clothing. That's correct. I really should get that, there. That, yeah, that's right. fascinating to me because yeah, me that's too. not one of those things that because I, I I've, I've read your book I, I I love it I read your your site all the time um, that you're doing that level of detail it, it speaks to it's almost like in cinema right or or you know the movies where you know the the costume designers don't get nearly as much credit as they deserve a lot of the time like by the general public but it makes the whole thing better if people are dressed the right way. 
Um, and that you're doing that level of detail is, is amazing to me. I'm um, really worried that the Czech guy looks too French right now. <laughs> Because he has a top hat on, and I'm like, well, maybe it didn't get there. But I, in the 1830s, that's how everyone dressed. So I'm assuming by the time like 1840 rolled around, all of Europe would have been pretty homogenized. But I don't know. So it's just like doing that. I, the fashion research for the book has been um, like drawing Celts, drawing Egyptians, Sumerians, doing beer history. Uh, I've been talking to Ron Pattinson, actually a fair amount about making sure my 18th century breweries look authentic. Oh yeah. You can't, you, you, you have to run all that stuff past uh, either Ron or Martin, Martin just because yeah. uh, otherwise they will just, Oh, no, they, will they, are, they are so brutal online. They really, are so brutal online and I respect and in person too, but yeah, I really, re and I respect their opinions as well. Oh, so yeah. Making sure that like, that's my, that's my huge fear is that when I put something out, online that there's something wrong with it and so mm -hmm. uh, actually before anytime anything goes out uh, so my my website is the content is a hundred percent like i mean i have almost a year worth of content waiting to be published wow. like it's there's a lot but every morning when i wake up before i publish it i triple check i, I almost draw it again just to research it, to make sure it's accurate. And I'm still terrified that I'm like, that's my greatest fear is that I'm putting something out and then it's wrong because mm. man, is there a lot of bad beer information out there. Um, so I make sure I use like actual, like good or good, what I think are good sources. Yeah. Um, I feel like a listener to, on this podcast might be able to put you in touch with a fashion historian or something. I know. Well, I was yeah. thinking about going to a, um, I don't think Evan rail listens to this podcast, but I mean, you know, he knows, Check fashion and check history. And maybe I'll send, can... I'll DM him the picture and be like, what do you think? <laughs> My Joseph Grohl is extra slouchy, which I think that's the Joseph Grohl, the guy who invented the Pilsner. I think that's because he looks, he's also not supposed to be a very nice person is what I've okay. read. Um, so I made sure he's extra slouchy and kind of surly looking. Okay. Uh, so you're so... doing like a, like the Churchill portrait kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. He's real like, and he's like how he really is, not how history has all his portraits like his him. hair is messy like he looks like crap like even in his like official portraits so <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> is is america is modern american brewer fashion easier to draw or are carhartt's really hard to no hoodies are easy to draw and then i also make sure that like yeah and everyone's wearing safety glasses i'm like my book is very osha compliant like what i'm making <laughs> like it's, what brewery are you going to that where they're wearing safety glasses the the brewery in my mind okay where there the are good one. the good breweries where all the beer is good and it's clean and every brewer there's a you know brewers of all stripes are represented like i make sure my book also is like very keen on diversity there's okay. everyone is everyone is representative beers for everybody um yeah, like I'm like safety goggles. Safety okay. goggles are really important. And safety vests and hair nets on the beards. They that I don't have. Yeah, I don't oh. have the beard. I don't have the beard. I'll have to go back in. My book's due in <laughs> September. I got plenty of time. The first time I ever saw safety nets on beards was I was at Magic Hat in South Burlington uh, before it became Zero Gravity, uh, that that facility. And uh it was after whatever anonymous named conglomerate bought them. And uh, it's like Fifco or something or, you know, Amco. I, I forget what it's called. But um, but when I went walking in there, I go, oh, you need to wear a hairnet. And I was thoroughly shocked and surprised at that because I'd been at that brewery years earlier where, you know, I'm pretty sure like they were playing beer pong with the open fermenters. But um, <laughs> and they were all putting putting hairnets on their beards. And I was like, this hmm. is not the whimsy magic hat that I remember, but also. You know, we've all had, uh, or most of us have had, or some of us have had, uh, John Mayer's beard beard oh, from yeah. Rogue years ago, and we don't need to replicate that. Yeah, so. sure. Um, uh, brewery seems to have lost its magic. <laughs> they're, 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 I think they're all making it in Rochester now, and it's just kind of, I don't know, it, it was like a sort of a fun brand that I cut my teeth on drinking, and it's, oh yeah, you know, um, who who do you miss? Don, that that you were drinking, you know, early on that might not be around anymore. Brewery wise, oh. yeah. 
Um, well, I'll tell you, you know, I, I don't think it directly answers your question, but cool. Who um, cares? 11, <laughs> 10, 11 years ago, I was in Italy uh, at this beer bar called uh, Maché Sieta Venuta Afa, which is Italian for why did you come here? And um, uh, I befriended the, uh, the bar owner and he had in his cellar a 33 year old bottle of Lambic from a brewery called Island Bosch. And it, it had closed in the intervening 33 years. Um, and obviously I loved that beer because it's the oldest beer I'd ever had. Uh, it, there was a magical moment there in terms of being in Italy and this, this uh, mothballed brewery. Um, and I recently heard that they're going to reopen Island Bosch. So oh. I'm quite interested to see what that will be like. Oh, that is didn't it, answer your question. No, but. no, no. But I mean, is it, is it, do you know, is it, is it the same people or is it just like a name? Cause I get press releases all the time of like, Hey, here's what your grandfather drank in Pittsburgh in the fifties. And we resurrected the name and we're going to bring it back just like it was. And I was like, God, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, in, in this case, Island Bosch is a, is a Lambic brewery. So I mean, I, I think there's a lot more wiggle room there for not being exactly the way it was. Okay. Um, is it going to brew or is it just going to blend? Uh, I don't know, actually. But we'll see. I'm not you're, you're the one who, who created all these questions. So <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I will write a book about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you read a lot, Don, uh, and I you're do. always promoting books and you're one of the great proponents of, you know, if, if I ever write something and you, and you share it, I, I, see, I feel that as like a badge of honor because like, you don't share, you know, things that you don't like, um, you know, or you're just like really Canadian and so polite that, uh, um, you are just sharing it and not telling us, but, um, you, you've thought about writing a book. I have. Yeah. Ha, ha, have we dissuade you? In this these first couple of minutes of, of doing that or no I have um, I have a book in me that I, I think hasn't been written yet it's something that I think I think would be interesting for beer lovers but also would bring non beer lovers into beer okay so I think it's a good idea for a book um, I just you know like Emma's saying I'm I have a routine uh, for my day and I'm busy and I'll get around to it at some point. Okay. <laughs> but uh, be happy, f happy to receive introductions to your publishers. Uh, sure thing. I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to, to facilitate those, uh, those introductions. Um, when Em was talking about the boot, my mind went to the craft brewers conference and you know every year or up until the pandemic every year uh the beer industry would gather in different cities and there'd be an expo show where you could buy uh, fermenters and brew houses and kegs and glassware and all sorts of things and there, there was a small uh, glassware provider that would show up at these things every year that had the most extraordinary glassware collection and they had you know German steins that could hold you know, 15 gallons and, you know, like the boots that took like three guys to, to, to pick up and, and, and to drink from. Um, and I, I, as I was sort of like thinking about, um, uh, you know, that boot, I started thinking about like when we would hang out at uh, these conferences and years ago, Don, uh, I was with you when you hit 10,000 different beers that you had consumed. Yeah, right? in that Washington. The, yeah, in Washington, D.C. And that was like seven years ago. And this is yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah, this was before Untapped uh, or, you know, before like you had started cataloging it well before Untapped was helping people catalog their beers. What are you up to now? I am at twenty three thousand eight hundred and seventy nine. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Em. Um. All right. So what are your criteria as your because because there's a lot of people who tick beers and a lot of people who who taste different beers. And, and I've seen your your note taking system. But for somebody who is thinking about like, oh, I should start cataloging this. Um, I think you are the person to look to. Hmm. How do you catalog these beers? <laughs> um, so I take notes on every You're a beer. Role model. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. 
Um, I, I had a purpose though. When I started taking notes, I, I'm just a geek. I really wanted to learn about beer, how it's made, you know, the ingredients and what they taste like. So my taking notes was an effort, was an effort towards that. And maybe it's less so now, but I would take notes so that I would, I I could go through. And then I, I like to, uh, my notes also include to the extent I am able to get it. Um, technical information, uh, ingredients, uh, even like fermenter shape and things like that. I, I include in my notes if I have access to it. And so that I can then, you know, I go, well, I wonder what, like, what does, you mentioned open fermentation. So yeah. what does open fermentation actually create different flavors? And I can go through all my notes looking for beers that were fermented in open fermenters see if there's any common themes in there and then um and then of course you have to test your yourself so Mm -hmm. i can be at a brewery tasting some beer and if i this is a bad example because i can't taste open fermentation but but uh if i could taste a beer and say and and the brewer happens to be there i might go hmm do, are, do you use open fermenters? Because it tastes like your your beer is fermented in, in open fermenters. Does this taste like your beard? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Do you, do you guys require hairnets? Because uh, it tastes like you don't require hairnets. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I take I I do I do I you know same as everybody else. I I take notes on on the visual aspects and aroma and you know uh, beating and flavor and all that and then and then. Uh, I keep adding, you know, if I learn something about a beer I had three years ago, I can add that, you know, the hops, the hop, uh, the hop recipe mm-hmm. uh, to it and all that. And, 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 you know, it's not, it's not just ticking. I, like I say, I actually do go back to my notes quite often to, to test a theory I have on what causes certain flavors or, or whatever and this has become much harder now because there's you know there's so many brewers doing so many different things and they're not necessarily consistent um but uh but now i'm i'm definitely afraid of stopping taking notes of my beer and then like a year later regretting that i've missed two thousand of them so yeah <laughs> i keep going and and and, and i i wasn't saying ticking in in a derogatory sense because like i i That's why I wanted you to talk about your process, because I think that there's some people, you know, who do it because they like the digital badges or things like that. And that's like a nice little, you know, a nice little thing. But there are people who are really passionate in the same way that I think the three of us are on this call about what we're tasting and the process behind it and the thought behind it and keeping carefully detailed notes. I mean, they might only be good for, you know, for you, but um, it still, I think, makes you a a, a better drinker. and when you're writing about, or when you're when you're illustrating beer, um, Don just said the, the the word that I think is so key these days, you know, consistency. And there are such wild swings inside of styles these days. You know, ten thousand breweries in the country, uh, you know, and even more around the world. Um, is there a way to address that when you're illustrating? A style of beer? No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks very much for coming. Uh, yeah. On. All right. Yeah. It was great. Great to be here. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, so I'll give you an example. So I did the I I use BJCP guidelines. Okay. Um, for have those been? Uh, do those have those been updated since 2015? Because I that's uh, the only they, book that I have. They added that Italian grape ale and they added a Burton ale and they added new England IPA. Oh, okay. Good. In 2018 okay. or 2017, <laughs> but no, they have not been. So, so no, I, I, I would love to see BJCP guidelines on like pastry sours. Yeah, I will. Cause it's, it's for a competition. So like, yeah, I, get, no, I get it. Yeah. No, yeah, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm being, I'm being to, cute, but I'm also, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, but I posted what's the difference between a goose and a lambic and a brewery wrote me and they were like, well, and they kind of like, you know, it, this doesn't happen a lot, but people are always like, well, we love your work, but dot, dot, dot. Um, mm-hmm. And I get was, a lot of those. And it's yeah. like, and they're like, whoa, but, and, um, and I always, I always actually appreciate when people like kind of not argue with me, but like say like, well, you know, if you did, 
they're like the mass like it was the lambics are according to the bjcp zero to 10 but if you actually run it through a mass spectrometer it's like 20 to 30 so it's not technically accurate which this brewery is a lambic brewery that wrote me so okay they're probably correct um but i usually i just go by bjcp anyway so but yeah, so like it's just difficult because the thing that I is beer style simple. So everything's down to its nuts and bolts. But there's, you know, 50 different ways to brew a porter and yeah. still have it fall into the porter. So when I'm doing beer and styles, sometimes they're yeah. brown ales. Yeah. And some, yeah. yeah. And sometimes <laughs> like I work at a brewery part time where our porter is 100% a stout. <laughs> like, and our brown ale is a porter. Um, so, they're delicious beers, but yeah. But so what I usually do is I look at recipes, usually clones of commercial examples. Um, I have a, a membership in the AHA now, thanks to the American Homebrewers Association. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so looking through all those, and then I try to find a consensus of okay, does fifty percent of these recipes have black patent malt in them? If they do, then I will add that to the recipe guideline. That's how I usually, so when people kind of push and they're like, well, my recipe doesn't have that. And I'm like, well, there's like 50 million ways. Plus this is called beer style simple. Right. <laughs> like, it's got <laughs> simple in the title. Um, you know, we're not, I'm not trying to give you a way to actually like brew beer. I'm just saying, here are the things that make up a, a American Porter or yeah. any. I wonder if um, there's a, uh... There's a restaurant in Chicago called Next, or at least there used to be pre-COVID, and um, run by uh, the head chef there is um, uh, Grant Grant Assats, the you know Alinea, and very world famous, very often named top chef in the world. And the idea of Next is that they have an ever-evolving menu, and they do a style of cuisine in a period of time because. What Grant would say is that there's no such thing as French cuisine. French cuisine has evolved over centuries. So what next will do is French cuisine in Paris in 1850. And then it will be, you know, uh, Italian cuisine, Tuscan cuisine in 1920. And I wonder if really we should be looking at beer styles hmm. the same way. Like we talk about Czech Pilsner, but even a you know, other than Pilsner or Kell, Czech Pilsner has changed over the last, well, probably Pilsner's Kell or, or Kell tastes different today than 400 years ago. And if there isn't an authentic 1870s plate of food uh, next to your <laughs> authentically dressed guy, that's the Easter egg that you need okay. to put into the, to the manuscript. I'll make right sure now. they're eating when they celebrate Pilsner Native style. Czechoslovakian, oh, yeah, some kind of dumpling, or I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. You have to do the I'll, research. I'll do their. I'll email Evan and be like, I feel yeah. like they would be eating dinosaurs. <laughs> and but that, like, you know, but that's such an interesting thing, though, Don, because like when you think about like Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, and I use that example a lot when I'm when I when when I'm giving talks and lectures and whatever. Of in 1980, when that beer came out. It was something like 32 IBUs and it, it was revolutionary, you know, like, oh, my God, how can you have, you know, a beer that's pushing the stratosphere of the low 30s uh, for bitterness? And these days it's quaint. It's like, OK, you know, like, let's get you home, grandma, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that kind of thing. And so I, I yeah, you're beer, on to some you're on to something there. Beer is an evolution. Like I, I'm thinking right now about Hill Farms at Arthur or not Arthur. Sorry, Edward. Okay. Uh, when that beer came out, it was amber and filtered. And uh, what is it now? It's hazy. OK, it's a completely different beer than what it was 11 years ago. Not to say that it's. You know, it's essentially a different beer. So, yeah. or you look at BJCP guidelines and how they change. Or if you look at Brewers Association guidelines, because to judge the Great American Beer Festival, they change and every World year. Yeah. And World Beer Cup. And so different, like, I bet if you went back to the guidelines to judge in like 1998. Sure. I was actually, I was just looking at the IB. Um, I was reading Mitch Steele's IPA book and he has a list of B, um, GABF winners and the amount of like 
yeah, like tables analysis of various IPAs in 2002. This is yeah. the page I'm on. Like, you know, uh, Rogue um, XS Imperial Ale OG and Plato was 20. You know, like in like, <laughs> so it's that's nine. Quaint. Yeah, that's yeah, nine quaint, percent. Yeah. Calorie, 278 calories, damn. The IBU is 67, and that's the highest. So 32 highest in, yeah, 32 in 1980 and 67 in 2002. And that's the highest of all, because Bridgeport IPA, Green King, like there's a bunch of like beer small travel from Australia, different beers from all over the like world IPAs. And the like, yeah. it's crazy. The like, yeah, and then color, all the beers are, you know, the full sale IPA is no, the Lost Coast IPA is 26 SRM. It's super dark brown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty like most IPAs now are probably <laughs> so so it was a it was an almost black IPA before yeah. black IPAs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A... I'm sorry, West Coast Cascadian almost dark. dark. Ale. Yeah. Or what it, yeah. He says in this book they're two separate things, but I don't okay. Think no, I. It's, I don't think so. Oh, I'm not gonna. That's a whole different. Podcast. That's a whole other podcast <laughs> that I'm sure you know. We'll start hosting one of these days. Um, hey, I, I want to change tracks. Um, or we can keep going with this. But first, um, I do need to give a word of thanks to this episode's sponsors, and I hope folks will give them a closer look. Source Farmhouse Brewing in New Jersey is working with Hope for the Day, an organization to address mental health awareness. This week, they're releasing a new New England IPA with the proceeds going to benefit the group. You should visit sourcebrewing.com to learn more about the brewery and the beer and hftd.org to learn more about Hope for the Day. And remember that it's okay to not be okay. Uh, and my thanks also to New Zealand Hops. Uh, they are a sponsor of the show. They have been for uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, you should definitely check them out at nzhops.co.nz. Uh, and yeah, I'll tell you more about them as we go a little bit further because I lost my script. And so uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll get back to that in just a second. Um, we have changed our drinking habits in the last year. And Don, when you were out in the world, you were drinking, you know, you were out at bars, you were out at breweries, you were tasting all these different beers that you were, uh, that, that you were cataloging. Um, and Emmy, you've been working in the tap room at Fa uh, Fox farm for, you know, uh, before the pandemic and now, you know, certainly um, uh, afterwards, how, how has the beer world changed, you know, one done for you at home, but two M um, inside of a brewery tap room? Mm. Um, like, are you able to pay more careful attention or different attention? Are you drinking more or less? Uh, I've been drinking your... probably more alcohol, but less beer. Okay. Um, I've definitely in terms of numbers uh way back like i i i would normally taste around 2000 new beers a year that's largely on the back of you know taster flights in tap rooms which uh which don't exist so i'm now down to around you know 400 a year that pace. okay um but what i've been doing is uh, it's given me an excuse to to reach deep into my cellar and so I've been drinking a lot of beers that are, you know, 10, 12 years old. It feels good to, um, to, uh, they've been weighing on me because some of these beers are past their prime. Um, so it feels good to taste them and get, them, <laughs> get them out, uh, out of the cellar. Um, so yeah, I mean, just, uh, I, I wouldn't say, you know, I like to think I'm pretty thorough when I taste a beer anyway, so I wouldn't say I'm tasting differently. Um, Maybe I'm, you know, because I am drinking only full bottles and because I'm drinking deep in my cellar, which are, you know, they tend to be the 22 ounce bomber size bottles. Remember those? That yeah. doesn't exist anymore, but they used to exist. Um, and they tend to be imperial stouts and barley wines and that type of thing. So one of the things I do like about tasting those old beers is, is because with 22 ounces, I can taste how the beer changes with, with the temperature. Yeah. So I, I would say I've, I've noticed that more. Um but uh, yeah, drinking more whiskey. Okay. 
Well, we'll talk about that in a second. And I want to talk about the tap room, but I did find this script and I apologize. Like I said, I'm, I'm fairly crispy right now. So um, I do want to say very, very, very briefly, but uh, uh, enthusiastically because I mean it, uh, thanks to this episode sponsor, NZ Hops. They are a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted for over 150 years to produce some of the world's finest hops. NZ Hops are like no others, unique in their flavor and aromas. Visit nzhops.co.nz to explore more. And I'll point out that in my script here, uh, flavors is spelled with a U. Oh. The correct way, the, <laughs> the non-American the, 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 way, the queen, the queen's English way, um, yeah. and and to be clear, it's pronounced a boot. A boot. <laughs> um, I miss going to tap rooms. I miss going to breweries. I I always loved walking in and feeling like the energy of a room. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of the time, like the beer quality sort of matched the the room. Like if you're at a, like a so so brewery, like there's just sort of like a I don't know, kind of a shrug in the air of, of feeling, but like when the beer's really good, people are happy. There's extra animated conversation. The world seems a little bit brighter. Um, you know, certainly the brewery that, uh, that, that you work for, uh, M, uh, Fox farm, uh, is excellent and makes wonderful quality beer. Um, was there that energy beforehand and what's it like going to a tap room these days like does, does it feel different for you standing behind the bar well we're not open so yeah <laughs> okay but like but like but you're there and you're you're doing so we, curbside and you're, we do, yeah. yeah we've been doing curbside for 14 months now uh exclusively we moved to the back of the building we have a garage door that we open um so people there's a ring road that surrounds the farm so people drive then get their name and then we put their beer on a table and they get out or we put it in their trunk. Um, so we've been doing that for 14 months, um, which actually has been, I've really, it's, it's slower obviously, but I've really enjoyed getting new regulars. Uh, we get a lot of out of state drivers, um, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, and we're not close to no. any of those borders no, no. Not at all. i've wanted to have you on this show and i wanted to get you up like i wanted to to go up there in person and every time i like type it in google maps i'm like that's the middle of it's like, 45 it's minutes like, for me yeah it's like i so. like him but <laughs> yeah, that's 95 and yeah, yeah it's, it's that part where it's only two lanes yeah no uh, it's <laughs> it's unpleasant mm -hmm. uh, but, we are reopening soon we have not made the announcement of when Okay. Um, I am not looking forward to it and I hate being honest about that, but I am really not looking forward to people when I work. I, I am really not looking forward. You to know, it. you're in the hospitality industry, right? I, I'm aware. <laughs> um, but we do, we do, we're different than most other breweries. Uh, we do have a, a poor limit. Okay. Um, we are on the owner's private property. It's his home where he lives with his three very young children. So we're not, my joke that I get to tell is, uh, we're not a bar, we're a barn. Um, so if you want to, you know, have two beers, that's great. And then you can go to the pizza place down the street and Nico can cut you off the owner and he can get scary. So yeah, you don't want to, you don't want and very, don't, very, don't nice. fuck with Nico. Very nice man until you cross him and don't ever cross Nico. You should put um, that on a t-shirt. Don't fuck with Nico. I pro he probably makes a shirt like that. To be honest. <laughs> um, so I, I'm just worried about we've, people have started to be like, we, I don't, I haven't worked in a while cause I'm working on my book. Um, yeah. so, but people have started to call up and be like, when are you going to be open? Like, and they're, they're not being friendly about it. They're being impatient. Um, our, our, we finally made an announcement that we were opening soon. And before we had people on Instagram, Facebook, uh, were, you know, like, I don't understand why you're not open. I don't get it. I don't understand. And it's because people, we can't have, we're not allowed to have food. The town won't let us. And we, and there's a food mandate. So it's just like the amount of times we had to explain why we weren't open. Most people at the beginning were very generous and nice. It worked yeah. out really well. Uh, Fox Farm took care of us when like during the like heaviness of the pandemic, we all got to keep our jobs. It was wonderful. Um, but I am, I'm not, I see what people have to go through. We're going to do a reservation system to start. And I just, it's, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm yeah. nervous about, you know, people rolling up, you know, how many people, do you know how many people roll up who still think we've always been open? It's surprising. Like, we haven't been open in a really long time and people roll yeah. up. I thought you were open. It's like, if you looked, <laughs> well, I drove all the way from Providence and I'm like, well, that's your problem. <laughs> like, Have you heard of Google? Yeah. Like, you know, it's so I'm, I, yeah. I, I'm not, I, you know, I hate to be a downer here. I just, I'm not, and I'm worried about people, you know, just coming in and being crappy. And I know that yeah. you know, yeah. 90% of the people won't, but those, that 10%, you know, that 10% is, sticks with you. Doesn't oh, it? Yeah. I'm not looking like when we have to cut people off for the two poor limit, we're pretty loose about it. Like we'll give you another half poor or whatever. Like as long as you're not being a jerk, um, but we've, you know, we've cut people off for, and it's the rule, like the amount of like, do you ever go into a person's house and they go, Hey, could you remove your shoes and go, no, I don't want to like people do like people do that a lot in our brewery where we're like, you know, with this, is people take rules. off their shoes. That's your brewery. Well, you know what I mean? Like people, we have rules and then people go, well, I'm not going to follow them. Right. And it's just like, yeah, what? Like you're it's so I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm worried. I didn't, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about reopening and it's going to be soon. Um, and yeah, so where I, where I, I am here in, in yeah, Calgary, I yeah, the, the current situation, the rules are that, um, there's no indoor dining. Um, it, so all the tap rooms and restaurants have, have expanded their patios and everybody's outside. And, uh, some, some of the local restaurants are now posting for fun, the reviews that they're getting because it's April in Calgary and people are actually giving restaurants bad reviews because it's cold. <laughs> it, like people are just terrible. The internet, <laughs> the internet is not, the, not yeah. good. We did that once at Fox farm where a, a guy was smoking a cigar and he drinking a Bud Light that he had brought. <laughs> and the owner, you know, the owner of Fox Farm was like, hey, man. And like the guy like gave a lot of back talk and then he wrote a bad review and we post we that was the one time <laughs> where, where it's not normally we're not snarky like that. You know, we're very but the owner was just like, I couldn't not post it. Like, come on, man. Like, yeah, you're on my property. And these are like no smoking, you know, like don't bring your own alcohol. Like you got to watch your kids. You can bring your dog. The dog can't go inside, though. Like that's, you know, it's just common sense. So we were, we were yeah. somewhere, there's a beer garden in Jersey city years ago. Um, and maybe that wasn't it. I, I was somewhere once where a, a family walked in and there's large picnic tables at the place. Like it was like a beer garden type place and they put down a tablecloth and they started pulling, you know, like cakes and fried chicken. And like, they like set the table for a place and this place had a restaurant like attached to it but they brought like their own like meal. And I remember like, like there was something like either table decorations or they'd put like tiki candles down, like those citronella, like those globy ones uh, yeah, that yeah, go yeah. on the tables and like lit them. And like <laughs> the owners had to come over and be like, sorry, like, this is not, this is not like a public park. This is not okay. Like we have food here. And the people made a huge scene of like, well, we're going to order some beers. And it's like, you know, yeah. It's not like, like a brew. Yeah, like a brewery yeah. would be like people do that a lot. Like at in Germany, at, they at do Fox, that. Yeah, or at yeah. Fox. Yeah, Fox Farm people come in. They like set the table, or they like bring decorations, or they're like a lot of kids' birthday parties happen at the brewery, which is when it's outside. It's great because we have tons of pl like places for kids to run. Yeah. Um. And so like the more kids, the merrier. Like, it's a great place for kids. And then, it, but like. People will do that while they have a birthday and they'll bring food and then they want to set sit around all day and we have a two poor limit. And we're just like, <laughs> well, you know, we have a two poor limit. Like, you can have two beers, but like after like an hour and a half, two hours, depending, like it's yeah. time to it's time to go. Um can I have my son's two pours? <laughs> people uh, people do that a lot. Yeah. And we do not uh um, are they trying to be funny or are they like yeah. Oh, do they try to be funny or, they, like, or serious, like, yeah. 
Yeah, or people, my favorite is like when people read, they just immediately incriminate or red flag themselves where they're like, I see that check because we have a check mug, a five, right. like a half liter. Yeah. I get, can I get the double IPA in the big mug? And I'm like, that guy, watch <laughs> that guy. <laughs> oh, great. Hall's yeah. here again. Yeah. <laughs> um. And he brought his three liter Stein again. <laughs> we don't get right. yeah, and can I have Hannah's pores? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, down in the world of whiskey, I know you're tasting a lot there. What, what should everybody be looking to pour into their glass these days to help dull the pain and excite the taste buds of these extraordinary times we're living through? Uh, well, I'm going to say whiskey is always good. Uh, so really anything. Okay. Um, but, uh, there's two, there are two distilleries that I'm super stoked about right now. If I can, if you want me to talk about them. Yeah, please. There's one out of Ireland called Waterford. And, uh, what I love about them is every whiskey they make, they identify the farm and the barley variety, uh, that went into it and the year. Ooh. So it mm. is very much a uh, terroir vintage dated, uh, whiskey and i think that's super cool uh the other one that i'm super excited about is one that's actually not producing whiskey yet because a, a whiskey needs to be aged for three years before it can be called whiskey but there's a new distillery in edinburgh scotland called Holyrood, and they are taking a sort of brewer's approach to making their whiskey so for those who don't know Whiskey is made from a very basic beer that's then fermented and then distilled. Um, that beer they call, they refer to as wash. And, um, you know, they don't get super creative with their wash, but Holyrood is. So they're using chocolate malts. They're using caramel malts. They're using, uh, they're using kvike yeast. They're using uh, various things to make a more beer-like wash. And then... Uh, and then distilling it and aging it in barrels. And I was able to taste, uh, I tasted four of their uh, raw, um, they call it new make spirit. So before they can call it whiskey. And I mean, I've tasted uh, new make spirit from other distillers before, and it basically tastes like vodka. It's just pure alcohol. But the uh, new make spirit out of Holyrood, you know, I was getting raisin and gingerbread and, you know, all the all the types of flavors that we would we would look for in in a you know in a barley wine or an imperial stout those those flavors were present in the new make spirit so super super excited to to taste what what whiskey comes out of there hmm. that's awesome i gotta i was making notes as you were talking because now i'm i'm curious about uh about tasting those um don your work is appearing in uh Various magazines on malt, uh, the ones you mentioned earlier, which is great, and I'll encourage people to read your words and and learn more about malts and all the cool stuff that uh, that is exciting you and interests you, and certainly following you on, I guess, your public social media channels, your your Twitter, where you're posting a lot of puns. I don't know <laughs> if people follow you on Facebook or not, but like you know, on Twitter, you're you're funny as well. So the no, Donna really, it's just stuff that happens. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, we're, we're not like here to sell anything, but I mean, I, I am with ads, but like, you know, it's, uh, I want to, you know, give you proper, proper, uh, I don't even know, man. I am, <laughs> I need like a nap and a coffee and maybe some more coffee and then another nap. Um, and you mentioned before that you're doing commissions, which I think is really cool. Um, can you tell people about those? Cause people should be supporting yeah. your art. Um, before I just wanna, I didn't mean to rag on Fox Farm. I like feel I was like while Don was talking, I was like, oh, I didn't like it's a really wonderful place, and you should everyone should visit. No, that came that came through. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think everybody who listens <laughs> knows that there's assholes that exist out there, and those people make a bad experience for everybody. And if you're looking around and you can't see the asshole, well, then it's probably you. And so recognize and do better the next time. I just yeah I want. I, I'm like speaking I to really, the assholes. I, yeah, I love I love working there. <laughs> Which is like you know a, a huge section of the audience. So yeah, <laughs> that's what keeps our lights on. 
Uh, okay, but anyway, commissions. So um, I do a bunch of different commissions. I just started doing building commissions. So I'll draw like your favorite restaurant, if a restaurant that you love closed or a place that you like got married or whatever, or your house. Um, so I've done, I just did um, Mineral Springs Brewery and the owner was like, I want it at this time of night when the brewery looks like this. And I was like, you got it, man. And he was very happy with how it came out. So okay. um, I also do family portraits, uh, your favorite bottles or cans. Uh, $10 from every commission goes to beer culture because I really like the nice. beer And I've raised over $700 for them so far. -ish. Wow. Not this year, but like in general. Uh, I, want, I don't actually know the exact number. Um, but they're wonderful people and I want to support them. So that is what I do. And so it's fun to do different portraits. Animals are really hard to draw. I've been drawing a lot of cats recently. Um, dogs are really hard to draw. Uh, so I always tell people if they want their dog drawn that I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's just, um, Here's drew, your hamster. I drew yeah. someone's dog and then they emailed me back and they were like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> And I was like, it's your dog. And they're like, that's not my dog. And I was yeah, like, that right, is me... not a good boy. Yeah, yeah, that is. And they were like, well, and they're like, here's another photo. And I, I got it right eventually. But um, <laughs> I felt bad because they were like, that's not my dog. Um, so I, yeah, I do commissions as well. And that's been a lot of fun. I like what people have me draw. You know, what was it? A guy had me draw the margarita he spilled on his wife on their first date. <laughs> okay. he's like he's like draw this margarita it's for my wife i spilled a drink on her and then we started dating and i was like all right man here's your margarita. and it actually looks really good so not there's it's just a it's just a glass so it's just a margarita yeah that, um that is it has a story behind it, it. it has yeah. a story yeah and so it's a gift for his wife um but i'll draw everything from like you know i just did narragansett lager to a uh, dutch brewery that was a chamomile infused dunkelweizen so well, sure. uh, you know our homebrew i've done homebrew labels for people i've done and you know you name it i've done it and it's been it's a lot of fun it's a great drawing exercise um it's always fun to see what people want and i'm happy to oblige and everyone's it's been the the um it's been very positive so that's awesome yeah well talking with you guys has been restorative um I feel like Yay. I'm I'm still depleted, but less so because you know anytime I get to to you know you were in a low place if you if if we brought you up, Jim. <laughs> oh no! Blame it all on my roots. Um, but it's uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for thanks, M. Thanks, Don, for 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 doing this and on short notice as well. Um, you know, I wanted to to do a show this week. I wanted to do it with friends. I wanted to. You know, just kick back and relax. We'll get back to the, to the to the normal brewing and ingredients and everything else next week, everybody. But um, uh, but thank you both. I really appreciate it. Thank you. John. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And as always, you can reach me at John Hall. It's J O H N H O L L at beeredge.com or follow along on Twitter at John underscore Hall. And if you love smoked beers, join the This Week in Rauk Beer conversation by getting into the group on Facebook or following TW Rauk Beer on Instagram and Facebook. And if you check out beeredge.com, you can see the official tasting glass of the group. Just look for our merch page. Beer Edge is on social media as well, at The Beer Edge, and we're online at beeredge.com. There you can find episodes of this show, the podcast hosted by Andy Crouch, articles to sign up for the newsletter, and more. And if you want to learn about advertising on this show, you can reach out to Liz Melby. She's at liz at beeredge.com, and she'll tell you about our wonderfully affordable rates. Back with me is Jeremy Watts of Source Farmhouse Brewing in New Jersey. They're a sponsor of this episode, and we're talking about a new beer the brewery has coming out that's centered around mental health awareness. Jeremy, can you tell me about the specs of the beer, where people can find it, and ultimately who benefits from the sales? Yeah, the beer itself is a New England-style IPA. Uh, contains a lot of oats using the hops cashmere, azaka, and El Dorado. It ranges around, around 6 to 6.5%. The beer will be available Friday morning at 9 a.m. via our uh, beer, beerbroadcast.com website. And the beer is going to benefit the Hope for the Day Foundation, try to raise more awareness 
to mental health and suicide prevention. Super important. Um, thanks for doing this and thanks for being on the show and being a sponsor and for getting this initiative and this beer out there. I'll remind people that they can check out sourcebrewing.com to learn more about the brewery and you can learn more about Hope for the Day at their website at hftd.org and it's okay to not be okay. We're also sponsored by NZ Hops. In a little country far down in the Pacific, you'll find a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted for over 150 years with creativity and passion to produce some of the world's finest hops. This is NZ Hops. The industry originated in 1843, not long after the early settlers arrived from England. Years of partnership with a dedicated hop breeding program and farming knowledge handed down through the generations sees the current day master growers proudly providing 18 unique New Zealand hop varieties to the world. Visit nzhops.co.nz or find them on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at nzhopsltd. If you like this show, consider leaving a review on your podcast platform of choice. It really does help other people find the show. Don't forget to steal the spear every Monday and the BYO Nano podcast on the 15th of every month. Nate Schwaber does the music. Jeff Quinn designed our logo. And remember to defend Pilsner. I'm John Hall. New episodes of this show release every Wednesday. And that's when I'm going to be back again to drink beer and to think beer.